All right, uh, I'm going to be tackling uh, one of the more difficult topics of Christianity this morning, but I want to give you a, a good understanding of how it works uh, in, when it comes to the Trinity. The Trinity. So you should have a good understanding, you should try and have a good understanding of the Trinity. Why? Because a lot of cults out there and other religions, um, often they will attack uh, Christianity at this, at, at this, uh, you know, on this topic. And the reason why they do that is because you know, if you were to ask, you know, many Christians, hey, what are the difficult topics to understand in the, Christ in the Christian faith? Uh, undoubtedly, one of them would be understanding the mechanics of the Trinity. Uh, I don't think, uh, me personally, I, don't, I think there are topics that are a lot uh, more challenging, but uh, this one is one that is challenging for people because uh, it's, it's somewhat paradoxical, right? Like, there are two truths that are contradictory that are both true, but... I will explain that in a moment as we look. So sometimes you think, you know, don't you wish you could lift up the hood of God and look under the hood and then see how it all works? It's kind of like you open up a computer, you open up, you know, a car, and you can say, ah, that's how it all uh, comes together. Unfortunately, we can't do that, but I named the sermon this because I want to attempt to give you an understanding that if you were to look under the hood of God, um, when I talk about God and when I think about how the Trinity works and how it all hangs together, um, this is what I'm seeing in my head. So I've sort of drawn this out to help you have an understanding uh, of how I understand the Trinity. And obviously the Trinity can be a very hot topic, Different people explain things differently, uh, but I'll give you my thoughts on it this morning. So we'll start at 1 Timothy 3.16. The Bible says, and without controversy, so it's like undoubtedly, right? No doubt here. There's no, no fight about this. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So what is the mystery of godliness? This is the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. This is Jesus Christ. This is a great verse to keep in your memory when people ask, well, does the Bible explain that Jesus is God? Yeah, because Jesus did all these things and we see that God was manifest in the flesh and that's why Jesus Christ is indeed God in the flesh. He, and then he did all these things, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, if you remember, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, oftentimes this verse is understood as, uh, you, know, the, the mystery of, you know, the mystery of godliness, which is understanding the nature of God is, is so complex that nobody can understand it, which is not really what this verse is saying. What this verse is saying is that there is a mystery, there was something that was unknown about God, right? And now it's been revealed, right? So it was a great mystery, but this is the mystery, right? The mystery is that God was manifest in the flesh and justified in the spirit. But what we are talking about today is the complexity of this topic, he said, how, is God, how does God work? You know, how, does he, how is he like, how we, do we see him? How is he revealed to us in, in his word? And how did that infinite God become flesh? Right? So that's what we're talking about today. So we'll start building this visual for you as I speak through the sermon. Hopefully I don't lose you along the way, but I think the visual will help as we build out this sort of diagram that I've created of God. And this is what I am seeing in my head. And I'll show you as well how it differs to um, what some people think about the Trinity as well. So we'll start here. We've got white and gray, right? So this is the spiritual realm and this is the physical realm, right? And we can see in 1 Timothy 3.16 that somehow this God in the spiritual realm was manifest in the flesh. So that's going to be the canvas I'll just be working from. Now, first area I want to talk about is why do people feel and why do people know that the Trinity is a complex topic? Got it? Because it's somewhat paradoxical. Par paradox is when two things that seemingly contradict come together and they're both true, right? So on their own, it seems like they're contradicting one another. And that's what we see in 1 John 5. It says, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. And here we see the most clearest statement in the Bible of the Trinity, and this is why this verse is such a hotly contended verse, because it's so clear, right? And this is really, uh, you know, where the lines are drawn when it comes to King James Bible versus other Bibles, because a lot of Bibles remove this verse, right? Verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. But then look at this. And these 
3 R1. So you have this equation that's sort of alluded to in 1 John 5, that there are three, but at the same time, there are one. And people will, you know, have arguments over, you know, what's the best way to describe this three and one? Some people will say it's three persons and one essence. Some people will say it's, it's one person, but in three forms or in three different, you know, manifestations. Um, but because I see it as a paradox, I, I like to just describe this as, well, there are three persons that are simultaneously one person, or there is one spirit that is shown in three persons, but then at the same time, that one spirit is a person. That spirit talks, talks as though it is an I, as a, as a person. So I like to just explain the paradox like it sounds, and that's that there are three that are one. But I don't want to get caught up too much on what they are called. People have all different names for what they are called, but ultimately what we are left with and what everyone is trying to get their head around is how is there three but at the same time one? And I'll give you a story a bit later on in the sermon that may help you get your head around why uh, these two natures that are different can both exist when it comes to God. So we see here in 1 John 5, 7, these three, you know, whatever you want to call them, persons, entities, manifestations, whatever you want to, word you want to use, witnesses, or three spirits even, right? Because in 1 John 5, 7, we can see here, it's the spirit that beareth witness, and this is what I, I think this is probably the best term. The spirit that beareth witness, and there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And we, when you look through the Bible, all these three are spirits. The Father is spirit, the Word is spirit, and obviously the Holy Ghost is spirit. And these three are one, one what? Spirit. So sometimes I think the best word to use to describe this trinity is that there are three spirits that are the one spirit. But obviously these are personal, God is, these are personal spirits, right? So that's why they are explained as he and not it and whatnot, but also that one spirit is also a singular person, which is why some people use the word person. So we have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And I have these in this order for a particular reason, because we do see a hierarchy between the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, in the sense that the Holy Ghost is subject to the Word, and the Word is subject to the Father, right? So there is a sort of a, a hierarchy between them, in the way they relate to one another. And you can see here, I've put the word on the boundary of the spiritual, physical realm. And why is that? Because what we see in the Bible is this is, this is the aspect of God, right? And the person that interacts with the physical world. So that's why the word was made flesh. But also, how do we know that this, when we, when we hear the spirit of God, how do we know that's the spirit of God? Well, it's because the word of God is the Spirit of God. So you can see how, how does God sort of manifest into the physical world? It's always through His Word, whether it's by hearing the Word or it's by the Word actually being made flesh, right? And, and, and walking among, among us. And that's who Jesus Christ was. All right, so that's where we're going to start there. So, but then you say, well, this is obviously not the full picture of God because we don't believe in three gods. Because often people that will you know, reject the Trinity, they'll say like, well, you don't have three gods. That's why this cannot be an accurate picture, full picture of what God is, even though there are the three persons or three spirits mentioned, right? And we can't just connect them together with lines and just leave it at that either, because we don't believe in what's called partialism. Partialism means that the Word is one-third of God, the Holy Ghost is one-third of God, and the Father is one-third of God. So we don't believe these are separate, because we're we're not polytheists, right? We don't believe in three different gods. But at the same time, we don't believe that the Word is just one third of God because the Word is 100% God. The Holy Ghost is 100% God. The God the Father is 100% God. So we can't completely separate them and we can't completely bring them together. That's why this, these two exist. Look what the Bible says in Isaiah 43.10. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Right? So who is talking here? Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And look at this. And beside me there is no Savior. Now we go back to this picture here. If that was just the word talking, how could the word say, beside me there is no God, right? I'm the only God, because there's others. How can the Father say, beside me there is no Savior, when the word became flesh and was our Savior? 
So you see how, that's what I'm saying, that there is this paradox here that there are three, but at the same time, there is one, because these persons within the Trinity will speak in first person and in multiples, us and we, but at the same time, the one God that is these three speaks in I as well, like we see in Isaiah 43. So, like I said, I'm just building this picture just to show you, this is how I'm seeing it in my mind as I've been. So I just want to circle around the whole thing because at the same time there's three and there's one and that's what 1 John 5, 7 represents. Now what is the best analogy for the Trinity? Because people will, no analogy is perfect, but in order for people to try and understand how three can be one, we have um, analogies to help our understanding. One analogy might be, and a good analogy as well, uh, I don't have any problems uh, with these analogies, but I think one analogy sort of shines out in the Bible. One is, we say, hey, we're a three-part being, aren't we? The Bible talks about body, soul, and spirit, but there's not three persons, is there? There's one person, but at the same time, there's sort of three natures that we have. But at the same time, each of those natures, you could kind of say is an eye as well, because the, the spirit and the flesh, they, you know, go against each other. They, they can be in different places, because when we die, the flesh is on the ground, the spirit and soul are in heaven. So you can see that there is a somewhat distinction between the three, but they're one person. So some people will say, hey, that's a good analogy to understand. How can three be one? Well, you have body, soul, and spirit, but that's one. Another way people can understand it is through different roles. They can say, hey, you know what, I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a husband, and I'm a brother, but I'm the same person, right? But because I'm not God, the brother can't interact with the father because, you know, I'm, I'm limited. But God, because he's not limited, you have interaction between those different roles, don't you? You have interaction between the Father and the Word and the, and the, Word and the Holy Ghost. So that's another analogy. Another analogy that they try and explain as well, and you can see those analogies are focusing more on how God is one. But you can have analogies that, dis that uh, uh, emphasize more the, the threeness of God, right? And people will say, like, well, look, if we were in a band, right, and, and we had a band that's called, you know, Christ Singers or whatever, and there's three of us in there. We're all part of this band, but there are three individual per identities within that one band, and that's how they would kind of describe the, the essence, you know, like uh, there's a God essence that they all share, but they are not one person. Whereas I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? You can't go all the way to where God is three and they just share a nature, but then there's not one God actually there. But you also can't take away the fact that there are three entities or witnesses or persons that are interacting with one another and refer to themselves in a plural pronoun. So that's why in the middle, I think, is where that truth is and that's that paradox. But Another analogy, and I think this is probably the best one because I think this is the analogy of the Spirit because we remember we, when we looked at 1 John 5, 7, we saw that one Spirit is three Spirits. And another analogy that people use, and I'm just thinking of another one now, another one is like the egg, you know, the egg white, the egg yolk shell, it's one egg. One is water, Right? They talk about liquid can be, uh, you know, uh, water can be in a liquid, a solid, and a gas, but it's all water, right? That's another analogy. And I think that analogy actually fits the best. Not that God morphs from one into another, but that water can ex exist as three states, right? And we interact with water in three states. And sometimes you can have iced water, right? Where you can have ice with water, but you're still drinking water, right? So if you look here in the Bible, analogies. Look at how God describes the Spirit. This is why I think water could be the best analogy to really understand how the Spirit works because this seems to be the analogy that God uses for the Spirit. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly, look at this, shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So notice the woman at the well, right? He's saying living water, but he's referring to the Spirit of God that people will receive. Isaiah 44, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Look at this. I will pour my Spirit upon the seed. So notice that the analogy of water and the analogy of pouring out the Spirit 
It's like unto water, isn't it? My blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. Acts 2. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So very uh, consistent, you know, to see that the spirit is like water and an analogy of pouring it out onto people. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Look at John the Baptist. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So notice how Jesus baptized us with the Holy Ghost. And baptism is the physical symbolism of what's happening spiritually. So isn't it interesting that we are baptized with water and Jesus baptized us with the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Right? 1 Corinthians 6 11. Such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our God. So not only the drinking, the baptism, pouring out, washed by the Spirit. We washed with water. Titus 3 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So those are some verses there where I think, hey, I think a very strong analogy is water. Water exists as solid, liquid, and gas. They can interact with one another. But at the end of the day, if you put ice into water, you're drinking water, aren't you? So um, that, that's uh, my thoughts there in terms of analogies. Now, I'm not dogmatic on which analogy to use, but I, like I said, this one seems to be quite strongly supported by Scripture. All right, third area I want to talk about is uh, a 2D story. And uh, this story kind of really helped me to understand why God in his nature can be two completely different things at the same time, right? And this is one thing I learned a long time ago. Somebody gave me this analogy and it really helped me understand, well, if a God outside of our dimension stepped into our dimension, why can he be things that we can't be? And one way we can understand it is if we think of a 2D world, right? A 2D world, we are 3D, right? Three dimensional. But imagine a 2D world existed and we could somehow enter into that 2D world, right? And if we understand how somebody that exists in a higher dimension can confound those in a lower dimension, then it'll help you understand well, God, who exists outside our dimension, our 3D world, can exist in ways that can't exist in a 3D world, right? So let's say we had a 2D world, and, uh, and I just made these pictures in uh, Keynote, but I think that'll help you understand. We have Mr. Green in the 2D world, right? So just say this is, the, this is the world. He exists, two-dimensional, right? So we can see that he's green from a 3D point of view. But let's say Mr. Green was to meet Mr. Blue, right? And now he's looking at Mr. Blue. He doesn't know that Mr. Blue is blue. And he doesn't know that Mr. Green is blue. Kind of like you guys can't see what's within me, right? They can't see what's within them. But they're there talking about it. But when, when, when Mr. Green looks at Mr. Blue, what does he see in the 2D world? He would see this, wouldn't he? He'd see just a line, right? Because that's Mr. Blue there talking to him. But they exist, in, you know, in, in a 2D world. Now let's say in this analogy, that you know, I exist outside of this 3D world. And obviously the analogy is they're us and I'm like God in this instance, right? So let's say Mr. Green's walking out and I want to reveal myself to Mr. Green. So what do I do? So I stick one finger into this 2D world. There it is, right? Now, when Mr. Green sees me, what does he see? He sees a line. And he says, ah, now I know Victor is one line. But when Mr. Blue has an encounter with me, and I stick three fingers into the 2D world, 
So what does he see? He sees three lights. So now Mr. Green and Mr. Blue meet each other. What does Mr. Green say? Victor is one finger. Mr. Blue says, no, 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 I know, I know Victor. Victor's revealed himself to us. Victor is three fingers. And this is where the sparks fly, right? Where people, you know, argue over how this comes together. He's saying, oh, they're one. No, he's three. But what's the truth? The truth of the matter is that both is right. right? Because I exist outside of this realm, the way I manifest myself to this realm is different, right? The, how I exist, right? So I know the analogy is not perfect because here I'm just like creating one and three. But, you know, God in his nature is three and one. So we see him in the word as three and we see him in the word as one. And people fight about this, but both are true. This is the paradoxical nature. But I hope that helps you to understand why a God that exists outside of our realm can be two things at the same time, whereas we cannot. And it might confound people, but those two truths are there. And that's what we see in 1 John 5. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So I would just clarify, because there is a doctrine out there that God just changes, right, like this, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that God, I do believe that God is eternally three and eternally one, but that's what we see him reveal as three and revealed as one God. Now, this is where I'll be spending most of the time of the sermon just to build out this visual that we started with, with the spiritual and the physical realm, right? So let's start building out this visual, and we'll see verses where the descriptions of how this picture of God that, that, well, that I see comes together. Now, where we're going to start is, I think the clearest verse in John 1, uh, the clearest verse in the Bible is in John 1, 1, where we actually see this paradox described. Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you kind of see how that might work with a glass of water, ice water, right? You can say the ice is with the water, but it's all, it's, it's all water. In the beginning was the Word, look at this, and the Word was with God. There's a, there's a distinction there, but it says here, and the Word was God. Now some Bibles have corrupted this passage, right? Some of them say it was a God, little g, um, and they, they change it up. But the, but the Bible is very clear here that there is that distinction with God and was God. So if we were to go back to our diagram now, now that we're drawing some connections between these three that are one, we see John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word and the Father are the same. And how do we know that? Well, when we look later at this line, which is with, we see John 1, 1 in the beginning was with, was, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, if we compare this passage to 1 John 1, we see what is that God that is being referred to in John 1, 1? Well, in 1 John 1, 1, look at this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the Word of life. For the life was manifested, so this Word of life, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life. What? Look at this. Which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So in John 1.1, 1, 1, what was the word with? The Father. And this verse is saying, and the word was the Father. So that's why you can see here in this diagram that we have the three that are one. We have the word is with the Father, but at the same time, is the Father. That's that paradox sense. We've got John 1, 1, and we've got 1 John 1, 1 and 2 when we compare that. Now this is why, so I've used the words here with and is, because this is how I think the Bible describes it. If you were to look at a traditional diagram of the Trinity, this is what you would see, right? You would see the Father, the Son, and you'll notice that I've got the Word there, and I'm going to talk about it in a moment, where I think this is a little bit different to this diagram. You have the Holy Spirit. Now, they draw it this way as a circle in the middle rather than one God because 
traditionally, they just think that they just share an essence. Kind of like we were all in the same band. They're all in the same band, but they're not the same person. And this is where I would disagree with this. And also, I would disagree that the Father, when it says is not, this is not the words that the Bible uses. In fact, the Bible uses the terminology that these are actually with and is, right? As we look at different verses. So I don't really think this is correct where it says the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, and we'll look at some verses later that actually show that connection. Right? So let's go on. Now we've seen the connection between the Father and the Word. We'll look at the connection between the Word and the Holy Ghost. Right? So Ephesians 6, it says here, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So Again, this is another thing that people wonder about, where you, know, you have the Spirit of God, but then what is the Spirit of God? The Spirit of God is the Word of God. That's why when you're hearing the Word of God, like when you hear me say these passages, that's the Word of God. That's the Spirit of God that is moving throughout the people here. When the Spirit of God lives inside you, how do you know the Spirit of God is in you? Because the Word of God is in you. See, that's why we're born of the Spirit but we're also born of the incorruptible seed, right? Which is the Word of God. So you see there's that link there that, yes, there is a distinction between the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, but they are also one at the same time. So we've got here on the is, the Holy Ghost is the Word, Ephesians 6, 17. John 15, 26. But now we want to look at a verse where we see that there is a distinction between the two, that they are with one another. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, Father, he shall testify of me. Right? So you can see there that there is a distinction between the Holy Ghost and the Word of God, which is, you know, Jesus Christ talking here. Right? So here we have John 15, 26. He is, but also with the word look at the father now father and the holy ghost john 4 23 and we already sort of touched on this when we talked about the analogy of water the woman at the well there's some more verses in that passage it says here but the hour cometh and now is this is jesus talking here when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeketh such to worship him so how do i know that the father is a spirit. Well, verse 24, God is a spirit. So he's talking about worshipping the Father, and then he now interchangeably talks about God, which he's referring to the Father, that God is a spirit. And they that worship him, who was looking for worship? The Father, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, uh, you can see here in Romans 8 that all the spirits are just being used interchangeably here, right? This is a passage that kind of boggles people's minds. That, you know, we have three spirits, but they're the one spirit. Look at Romans 8 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So you see how it's changed from the spirit of God to the spirit of Christ. It's the same spirit. And if Christ be in you, Right, so is Jesus the Holy Spirit? Well, here's a verse that says that Jesus Christ is in you. But you say the Holy Ghost is in you. Well, the three are one. The body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now look at this. But if the Spirit of Him... So we have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of Christ. Now the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Who raised Jesus up from the dead? The Father. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So we can see that the Father is a spirit. You know, there's only one spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. That's why there's the three, but there are one. And now we see here that the Father is also somewhat distinct or separate from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. John 14, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Right? So he's not giving himself, but he talks about the comforter as another that he may abide with you forever. So we can see here, I'll just put here John 14, 16. So you can see each of them have an element of being one another, but they're also distinct from one another. And 1 John 5, 7 sort of keeps it all together. It's these three that are one. Now, when we talk about terms, 
there are certain terms that are generally used more to one of the spirits or persons within this trinity. If we see here, uh, God is generally used to refer to the Father. And I just say generally because it's not always the case. But to us, there is but one God, look, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So I've just put God here, and just put a dotted line, to just show that even though this is God, and all of them are equally God, but generally when the Bible uses the term God, it's referring to this person, or spirit, or you know, attribute, you know, whatever you want to call it, of God, right? Being our God, our Heavenly Father. Now, we looked at passages in regards to the Holy Ghost, but the Holy Ghost has a name that is generally ascribed to the Holy Ghost, which is the Comforter. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So I'm just going to add this here, that the Comforter, even though Jesus comforts us, right, cares for us, we cast all our cares upon him, We've got the God of all comfort, but the Holy Ghost has that specific term in John 14, that the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. But I'm just trying to show you how this all kind of links together and where the emphasis is. And we're still just focused on the spiritual world here. Now we come to 1 Timothy 3.16, where God was manifest in the flesh. So this spirit that is a three-in-one spirit of how we see it in the physical realm and how it's revealed to us in God's word, that spirit now became flesh, right? And that's who Jesus Christ is. And like I said, like the word interacts with the physical realm, this is why I believe the Bible describes this as the word was manifest in the flesh. John 1, 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when we talk about God stepping in to this realm, we can't really just say that the Word only stepped into the realm. Why? Because this still exists. Right? So we can't just say like this just separated itself and just came into the flesh because the Word is with God and was God. The Word is the Holy Spirit. So this all became flesh, but it's right for the Bible to describe it as the Word was made flesh because this is how the Word of God interacts with the physical realm. So here we have the physical man, Jesus Christ. And this is where you get... A second paradox, if you didn't know, that's already one paradox, three and one. But you also have the paradox of Jesus being both, because even though I've connected this with a dotted line, I'm just showing you the connection. It doesn't mean they're necessarily separate. That Jesus, if you, you know when people talk about Jesus, they say that he's not only man, but he's, a, he's 100% man. That's why he had to sleep. That's why he got tired. That's why he had to eat. That's why he had to pray. But he's also 100% God. Right? So not only is there this paradox that there are three uh, witnesses, persons, spirits that are the one God, one spirit, you also have God being both man and divine, right? When he took on this additional nature. And this is why a lot of Muslims don't understand. And this is where a lot of people get confused because they say, well, how can God, you know, how can, you know, Jesus be God. Well, he's God in this sense because he's the spirit of God manifest in the flesh. But does he have human attributes? Yes. Does he have divine attributes? Yes, because this is the full picture. Right? The full picture is that all this is going on and the nature of God is very complex. Right? And that's why sometimes we are talking to this. You know, he doesn't know the day or the hour God comes, but then he knows their thoughts. You know, he's born, but yet he created all things. Right? So, I don't think this paradox explains all of it. That's why, in my mind, I'm trying to show you that there are two things going on. There is the three-in-one trinity that we talk about, but there is also God manifest in the flesh, and that's the divine and uh, human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we see here that not only is it 
one way that made flesh, but also that we refer to this, this man is also made a quickening spirit. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 15, I think the distinction there is that Adam was given life and brought death into the world. And then Jesus died and brought life into the world, right? So that's why he's a quickening spirit. What does this word mean? If you don't know, to quicken means to make alive, right? It doesn't mean fast, right? So it's made a quickening spirit. So this is where here, when it talks about the quickening spirit, it is referring to the word of God too. John 6, 30, uh, 63, it is the spirit, this is Jesus talking, it is the spirit that quickeneth. What is he saying there? It's a spirit that brings life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, look at this, they are spirit and they are life, right? So this is why I've made this connection here, right? So it's made, word was made flesh, but also that flesh was made a quickening spirit. You can see that connection there with the spiritual realm. Now we, what is this flesh, right? And this is where I think the terminology, the Son of God comes in, right? So that's why you saw before, if the, the traditional Trinity is Father, the Son, Holy Ghost, I think more accurately and more technically, it's Father, Word, Holy Ghost, and then it's because of this making manifest in the flesh that this Word is now can be referred to as the Son, right? Because there's a point in time where that role was taken on, right? Where God became flesh. And we see that in Luke 1, verse 35. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So this is why this is referred to as the Son of God, but it's equally right to refer to this as the Son of God because it's the Word was made flesh, right? But why can you say Father, Son, Holy Ghost? It's because at a point in time, Luke 1.35, God was manifest in the flesh, right? And that's who Jesus Christ is. So we see this man who was the God-man manifest in the flesh. Obviously, we know his name is Jesus. I'm just building out this connection. Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, likewise, when I said God is generally referring to that aspect of God, the comforter is generally referring to that aspect the name of Jesus Christ is generally referring to this aspect, the man Jesus Christ. But is it right to say that Jesus is the Word, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Father, the Holy Ghost, and all these? Yes, because God is all of this, right? God is not just that. So why can we make those logical claims? Because this is the nature of God, right? It's that God that was manifest in the flesh. Now, Jesus is his name. We also know he's referred to as the Messiah or the Christ. So we'll bring that word into our diagram. John 20, verse 30. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Right? So Jesus is called Jesus Christ because he is the Christ. It's not that his first name was Jesus and his last name was Christ. <laughs> you know, some people think that you know, Jesus Christ is his family name. No, they, he would have been Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus, you know, son of Joseph and whatnot. And that was something interesting that I learned from Ozzy, actually, right? Because Ozzy's a Syrian. And he told me that they don't have last names. So it's interesting that, you know, that's why his, his, his name on his birth certificate is like Joseph, Joseph, like Joseph, Joseph. <laughs> now, John 1, we see what does Christ mean? Christ means Messiah. John 1 41. He findeth. First findeth his own brother Simon, so this is where they're meeting Jesus, the disciples, saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Right? So Jesus Christ is the Messiah that is born. He's the Son of God, who is the Word made flesh, but you know, the Word is the Father, is the Holy Ghost. These three are one. Now, we can see this connection. In the Bible as well. See here in Colossians 2, and this is why I'm saying to you that Jesus Christ is not just the Word, He's not just this part, right? Because look at what the Bible says in Colossians 2 9 For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of 
the Godhead bodily. And that's why even though it's right for the Bible to say the Word was manifest in the flesh, the Word is God, it doesn't take away from the other parts. Right? So this is not just this person and just this part of God manifest in the flesh. It's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So this spirit is what was manifest in the flesh, and that's the Son of God. Okay, Jesus Christ. Now, this connection is so strong. You say, like, can you make a connect? This is why, because these connections exist and the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwell, that this person can be referred to these things. And I'll show you that. And this is where things get really contentious amongst the uh, Christian circle, right? Look at this, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. Look at this. The Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So you see, how, is there a distinction, obviously, between the Son of God and God the Father? Yes. But you see how the connection also is so strong that, well, is there, is, is a reality that the Son is called the Everlasting Father. You see that in Isaiah 9, 6? Look what Jesus says here. I don't know if you've ever seen this verse before in John 8. We all know that Jesus said, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. But do you know in that passage, he defines who he is that he is referring to. He said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And this is the verse we go to that shows in order to be saved, a person must believe Jesus Christ is God. That's why you have, that's a, a lot of the contention about why people who reject the Trinity, you know, are, are not real Christians, right? Because if you reject the Trinity, generally when you're rejecting the Trinity, you are saying that this is not God. You're severing that, Right? And you're saying, Jesus Christ is not God. If you do not believe that this man is God, Jesus says you will die in your sins. Right? That's why you must believe that God was manifest in the flesh. You can't just believe Jesus is a prophet, Jesus is an exalted angel, Jesus is an exalted man lifted up. No. Right? Jesus was created. Right? Where people get confused because the man had a beginning. But God didn't have a beginning. But this man is God manifest in the flesh. Right? Okay. Look at what Jesus says. If you believe not that I am here, you shall die in your sins. But look at what he goes on to say. What he goes on to say. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? Who are you? He says, You believe not that I am here. Then who are you? Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. So here's who he's referring to, the Father, right? Well, we don't have to guess that, but he's saying, I am he. Then he says, he that sent me, the he that he's referring to. Look at verse 27. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. So when Jesus was saying to them, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins, who was the he that he was referring to? God the Father. Right? That's why you must believe these things. You must believe that Jesus is God. And this is what he's plainly telling them here. He didn't under, they didn't understand that when he said, I am he, he was referring to the Father. Right? So we have this connection here. So I put it here. That you can be referred to the everlasting Father. He, they understood not that he spake them of the Father. Isaiah 9, 6 and John 8, 23 to 27. And let's look at this last connection. The Son, or Jesus Christ, is the Comforter. We already sort of talked about the Word being the Holy Ghost, so there's already that connection. But even here, because the Christ, remember, is specifically referring to, or more generally referring to, this Messiah that came, that was born, right? You know, the Messiah is born in the city of David. This day is born in the city of David, a, a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. Well, look at what it says here in 2 Peter 1. Verse 21. And this is referring to prophets speaking the word of God and by what, how are they speaking? They're speaking through the Holy Ghost. 
For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by what? The Holy Ghost. Right? So we understand that. The Bible is not just the words of men. The Bible is the words of God being moved. Men moved that they spoke. It was actually the Holy Ghost speaking. So some people think the Bible is just, you know, inspired by God, meaning like, you know, you have an idol that you look up to and it's, oh, you know, it's so inspiring. I'm going to write something that they inspired me to write. Some people think that's how prophets were inspired. No, the way when we talk about inspiration of God, that word means it's actually God breathed, like God is actually speaking through them. That's what this verse is saying. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now let's look at 1 Peter 1 now, where he talks about these prophets speaking by the Holy Ghost, but look at how he describes it here. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So he's referring to this prophetical preaching that the prophets spake, you know, that they didn't necessarily understand because they inquired and searched diligently of the things that they even wrote down. Verse 11, searching what or what manner of time, look at this, the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So isn't it interesting that the Holy Ghost is also referred to as the Spirit of Christ? And remember, Christ is referring to this Messiah that is coming. So you can see how it all links together, and the Son is made a quickening spirit, and these three are one, right? So I don't see necessarily this man as being one within this Trinity. I see a Trinity of spirits, and that spirit being manifest in the flesh, right? And that's who Jesus Christ is, and that how, that's how it links together, technically, in, in my mind, right? I know uh, other people would have different pictures. So this is why, like I referred, to, like I talked to you about before, because the Word was manifest in the flesh, and that's the Son, this is why the Trinity doesn't need to just be referred to as Father, Word, Holy Ghost, but can also be referred to as Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Right? So that's why I believe the Son can rightly be described as Word manifest in the flesh, but also the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we can see the connections also to the other terms. Matthew 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So you see how it's not incorrect to describe the Trinity as Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But like I said, this is how I think it all hangs together when you look under the hood. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Second Corinthians thirteen fourteen, we see here as well the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So that's the man, the, the Word, the Son of God, and the love of God. So a lot of people believe that's referring to God the Father, like we talk about these general terms, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So we see here all three aspects of that Trinity are mentioned there. So that's how I build that together. So hopefully that helps you, because I'm sure a lot of people, when they talk about the Trinity, they talk about the Godhead, a lot of these terms get thrown around, and you're kind of wondering what you're picturing in your head. Over the years that I've been studying this out and thinking about it, that's sort of where I'm at right now, whereas when I think of God, I think of there is a spirit that is three in one, that spirit became flesh, and that's who the man Jesus Christ is. That's who the Son of God is. And that's why I take the position of incarnational sonship rather than eternal sonship because there was a moment where he was incarnated, but it's not wrong to refer to the word as the Son because of the connections that are there. So in conclusion, last thought is, so if we were to see God, a lot of people ask this question, if we were to see God, what would you see? You know, he's depicted in different ways. Uh, I don't agree with the depiction where you see like a dove and a young man and an old man sitting or commuting in heaven. I, I don't agree with that. Um, now, in Acts 7, a man was able to look into heaven and see God. So I also think we don't have to wonder what we will see when we get there because it's already in the Bible, right? And if you know about the story of Acts 7, Acts 7 is when uh, Stephen was stoned he was preaching to the Jews. They didn't like what he had to say about Jesus. He was stoned. Before he died, he looked up to heaven. Look what he says. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, 
looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. So notice he didn't see God, he saw the glory of God. Right? Because often God is represented as a light that you can't see. And that's why I think the Spirit, you can't really see God, the Spirit of God, but you know the presence of God is there because of the light. Right? You see the glory of God. Look at this. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So, you know, obviously different people have different theories. That's what I think we'll see. I think if we go to heaven, we will not, you know, there might be somebody sitting on the throne. We don't, can't really see it, but we will see like in Revelation, you know, the Lamb of God is there too. And that's like Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So we'll see the man, Christ Jesus, but that man is that person of that glory of God that is manifest in the flesh. But we will not be able to just look directly at God, but we'll be able to see the man, Christ Jesus, who is that God manifest in the flesh so going back to this you know a lot of people fight over and unfortunately separate over how you may understand god you know unfortunately none of us can literally look under the hood of god but today hopefully today's sermon gave you a bit of a peek under how it all hangs together but the last point i just want to talk about is look when it comes to the Trinity and the Godhead. The most important thing is what Jesus said. If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You must believe that Jesus is God. Now, how the nature of God works and how it all hangs together and the terminology we use, as long as it doesn't compromise that important doctrine of Jesus indeed being God, Christians should be able to peacefully discuss this concept of how they all hang together, right? And not fight and separate over it so that's what i want to leave you with is you know yeah this is something i think we can discuss and we can talk about we ought not uh fight and separate over it is a very difficult doctrine it's one that even if you were to look today you might be a little bit confused but i think it's just important how you know it all hangs together so that when people attack your faith you have analogies you have descriptions you have verses of how you can explain it. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, thank you that you are a God that is not limited to our imagination. You're a God that is outside of this world. You're not a God that's made in our image. You know, we, our man was made in your image. So we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you that you're eternal, that you're the beginning and the end, uh, that you are complex in ways that it's hard to wrap our mind around. So we thank you, Lord, for revealing your nature to us in your word and uh, lord we just pray that you help us to study and to understand and to lord give a defense of you and of the lord jesus christ we pray these things in his precious name amen